But what I've seen is that everybody has the same plan. Every single person has the same plan and their own plan they think is very, very unique. And the plan is goes something like this, that I'm going to work for, a, I'm going to start working for a good company. Then I'm just going to get promoted. Then I'm just going to find a good place to work at, maybe overseas, maybe in my own country, wherever. And then I'll make a bit, bit, bit more money. Then I will get married, I'll have kids, or I'll buy a car or I'll buy a house. And then I'm going to buy another investment property, then buy another house. And then I'll keep paying the, the bills. And then one fine day, I'll have my life sorted out. I create clear thinking and decisive leaders who can amplify their influence. Contact me to find out how I can help you or your organisation. And today, our guest is Kapil K. How are you doing, Kapil? I'm doing very well, thank you. How are you? I'm good, thank you. Kapil, what do you enjoy doing the most? Well, what I enjoy doing the most um, is actually something that makes me feel alive, which often is about either, and these are disparate things, either talking to my kids and really doing some activity with them when I'm creating. And my kids are older. My kids are like 20, 23. That's one. Second, if I'm talking to somebody about any of my clients, often these people end up being my clients as, as a coach. That's what I do. If I'm talking to somebody about creating some opportunities and possibilities and I see them alive in energy, that just um, gives me a massive kick. And the third thing which I enjoy most in my own personal space is really listening to a book or reading a book uh, where I can actually absolutely feeling that I'm feeling very free to color it up in terms of, um, in terms of uh, underlining and all. So, yes, I love these three things a lot, lot more than most of the things. Okay. Tell us a bit more about you. So, look, I live in Australia, Sydney. I've been here for 15 years. I have worked with corporates in my past life for 22 years with likes of Microsoft and Cognizant. In fact, in Microsoft IT, I was the eighth employee in Microsoft IT India. And in Cognizant Australia, I was uh, one of the two people who started this business in in, in 2009. So Cognizant Australia Division, Cognizant, as your readers, listeners probably know about it, it's a multi-billion dollar company. And I started their Australian business along with uh, somebody else. I led the business for a few years. And then I, in 2017, when I had ticked off all the various things about reaching a certain designation, playing a senior level role, really money-wise, property-wise, everything that typically people have those dreams, I called it quits because that's something when I, when I, at that time I realized that this is not me. It's not aligned with my core, my DNA, my being. And I quit my job. I started my journey as a coach um, with a lot of expectation that when I'm going to wave off my, my cognizant banner and my senior banner and my certification, people will be flocking around me. But none of that happened. I failed massively, uh, massively in my first year. Then my wife joined it full time. And now, six years later, it's a very substantial business. We do this full time. We work with people in the corporate world, individuals in corporate world, not with companies. Individuals in corporate world really build very powerful careers and powerful lives. Find addiction, leverage their core identity and really build much, much, much more powerful life than they have lived so far. All right. Brilliant. Thank you for that. So let's unpack that a little bit. So I guess the first thing then is that individuals need to be able to find their voice. How do you do that? How does someone do that? So look, finding your voice is a lot more, it's, it's not so much about, it's not, people think that finding my voice is really about my expression. It's about how I talk. Finding, finding your voice is, in my world, it's about knowing who you are at the very core of your being, knowing your core inner values. And letting that drive everything. I don't believe in the superficial changes that that we all like to make, including myself, because I do want to come across as a phenomenal guy. I want to come across as somebody who's meeting all his needs of significance and getting noticed. But if I do it on basis of the superficial change of how I talk and how I look, then it's going to be not, it's going to be unsustainable. So once people find their identity of who they really are, what is their core circle, inner circle? Um, what is their core motivation? What is their why? 
then finding a voice becomes a lot more easier. And that's when they start expressing it. That's when that's when they start experimenting with in life. That's when that's when they start exploring themselves, and that's that's when they start exposing themselves and exploring their potential. And that's when they truly find their voice. Thank you. So once someone's found their voice, how do they go about increasing their influence? Yeah, look, one of the best thing about finding your own voice is that because it's a reflection of who you are fundamentally, instead of trying to increase your influence, it automatically starts happening. Because find and and, and obviously in that process you have to use the tactics and strategies and branding and uh, maybe podcasting or whatever it is. But all of this comes from a place of being rather than a place of doing. So influence automatically develops by leveraging whatever tools that you have available. Like some people could be very energized and and start creating your, their own podcast. Some people could be very energized and start creating the videos. Some people are very, people who really write very well. Um, some people are just just extremely good in networking with people, and and once they're coming from that place of being, then then the influence automatically starts coming in their own life. Hmm. But do you feel like there's more that can be done to oh, to I... to build an influence? Yeah. Yeah. Look, once you have, so obviously there are strategies and tactics, but once you have your core set at that time you have to obviously leverage strategies you have to leverage um other people like having a coach is a great way to increase influence building with building people um connecting with people is a great way to do it building your brand putting content out there is a great way to do it um so once found your once you found you find your found your voice voice and then it's a matter of leveraging other people tactics and strategies you know to to actually start building the influence um yeah. I think that's quite curious. So I do a lot of um, influence mentoring to help people to amplify their influence. And one of the things that I do is I have a scorecard um, called, how, you know, about, you know, how influential are you? And it can be accessed on amplify, amplifyyourinfluence.scoreapp.com. Um, and I think for me, if you want to become more influential, you need to be proactive about it. Influence doesn't come solely from from waiting. Do you know what I mean? I mean, like, I guess what I guess what I'm saying is that you you can do certain things. You find your voice. You you use that voice, and you become influence influential to a degree. But if you're um, a business owner wanting to attract clients or a senior leader that wants to uh, be promoted or to be able to get their um, their peers or key stakeholders stakeholders aligned to them, then you need to actually be more proactive and more dynamic with it. Do you agree or? Oh, I 100% agree. No, absolutely. Uh, Judith, you have nailed it. It's required. Like there are... If I do not, and I love the scorecard that that you have. Look, if you don't know where you are, how would you ever going to be able to find out what are the gaps between where you want to be and where you are? It's not possible. And and a lot of people actually tend to just straight away start jumping into things without really doing a status check of where they are. So that definitely does it. And then after that, what is the area? What is the one or two areas at max which you want to focus on? And then you take deliberate actions where you can actually measure how you're doing. And that's how you increase your influence very gradually. Like if you, if, if you just want to get from A to Z, it's not going to work unless you go like, you know, unless you are leveraging other people, even in that case, A to Z is not possible. So, so I, I 100% agree with that. So I guess there's a danger that the, that what, we try we end up doing is manipulating rather than influencing and there's the, the, the there's that line that we need to be very careful of not crossing so what we need to make sure that the when we have intention we're not manipulating those around us to make it happen and then calling it influence because it makes us feel better 
Yes, you're so right. And look, that's that's the fun of coming from a place of being. That's the fun of um, coming from the place of your identity. Everybody has a message. Uh, whatever is the message, they have got their own message and people who are aware of it need to find a way to push that message across to the people because at the end of the day, in the beginning, it might feel like you're getting significance and you're feeling happy about it. But at the very core, if you are driven by contribution, then it's your responsibility to also find out ways to do it. And if you do it in a fake way, then one day somebody will catch it. And then, and that's just kind of taking the floor off your feet. But if you are standing on a firm footing, then things can go wrong. You could say a wrong thing here and there. It doesn't make a difference because you're coming from a place of being. I like that because I was just I was just thinking about what you were saying. And I agree, it does come from a place of when you come from a place of being, you're more likely to be influential rather than manipulating. And when I think about the components of influence, as I see it, it's around capability, decisiveness, power and impact. But even beneath those four components, it's it's how you're interacting with other people and who are you when you are it? Who are you being when you're doing that? And I think that when you take it from that perspective, you're very unlikely to work against the greater good. And I think sometimes people go, oh, yes, I'm going to be a great influencer. And what they mean is I'm going to be really good at manipulating things. That's <laughs> what I want. Yeah. Yeah, it's like there's a, there's a saying, right, that you can fool few people for some time, but you cannot fool all the people all the time or, you know. <laughs> So, and, and, and I, and I, I hear this from people that, oh, fake it till you make it is a good idea because when you keep faking it, you keep, keep saying you are this person then eventually you become that person. But that just, if it was a statement in isolation, maybe it could be true. I don't know. But, but the problem with that statement is that if you fake it, you know it that you're faking it. And that just knowledge that you're faking it is going to get you in some other areas. And that's eventually will catch up with you. And eventually the loss will be amazing. And, and by the way, uh, uh, look, I, I'm not just saying it because it just seems like a really cool thing to say, Judith. I know I did that. I, I did that. I tried to be somebody else pretty much throughout my corporate life where I would look at somebody within the company who had this amazing persona and I would get very influenced. And for next um, few days, I would talk like them, walk like them, almost feel like them um, till it would just feel so empty and then I try to go to somebody else and try to be like somebody else, um, you know, and, and it just never, ever felt good. Never, ever. And so, and I gave it up. I realized that that's not, that's just not going to cut it. So I learned this lesson a very hard way. I was, um, you know, from the school of hard knocks where I failed miserably following that, that, that tactic. And then I just decided that's never ever going to come back in any other way. Like for instance, like being from, one, one example is people from Indian background. I live in Australia for 15 years. And some of the words like Australia, which is not a word which I would repeat in India many times other than cricket, they are very, yes, more or less said in, in Australian accent. But other than that, I did not adopt it because I want to fit in in this particular place. Um, so I'm one of those people who have a very strong accent, Indian accent, but that's who I am. I'm not going to change my accent for somebody else. Sure, some people can't understand me, but that's okay. But I'm not going to change my accent. But this is who I am. And I'm very strong about it. I'm very biased about it. I'm not going to change myself for somebody else. If I feel like that, I should. But I know people who basically come to this country and they suddenly start talking like, you know, scratching their eyes and all of that just because they want to fit in. And it doesn't go well. It never goes well. So you have to be yourself. Yeah, I can I can totally get that. And I was just thinking, though, there are some people who just pick up accents, for example, without even thinking about it or trying, and their accents yep. change, and that's who they are. So I think yeah. sometimes yeah. when people are assimilating into a new culture, it, I suppose as an observer we don't know the reasons for that or even if there's any thought process in that either and i and i think also i i've noticed like with organizational cultures if someone's got really strong 
rapport with others and it's a natural thing, then without thinking, they will start picking up that culture because they are naturally trying to align and get on with people that it's just a process that happens that they're not even aware of. Correct. When people are not aware of it is all right. Like my daughters, when they came to Australia, they were like five and th- five and two. And at that time, they picked up the accent very normally. And in fact, so much so that, that they talk to us in an Indian English accent and they talk to their friends. They talk in uh, Aussie and they just can't help it. And we have told them that, why don't you change? I said, I can't. I can't change. That's very natural. And, you know, if obviously we sp- spend time with people, like if I was spending a lot of time with people who are from here, I would have automatically picked up. And that's probably how I got Australia. You know, obviously when I'm talking to you, a bit of words will change, but that's automatic. But when you try to do it from a place of, oh, with this, I'll be able to build connections. With this, I'm able to, if you become deliberate about it, then it's a problem. But if you're automatically doing it, yeah, we just all got to be who we are, you know? So, Again, yeah. I completely agree. It's down to intention, isn't it? If you're doing it because you feel you have to do it, then that's where it can be problematic. But yes. if you're doing it because it just what it's happened, that's fine. Let's listen to a quick advert. The Maverick Paradox. Judith Germain is an author, speaker, consultant, mentor and trainer, and the leading authority on Maverick leadership. She is the founder of The Maverick Paradox, which supports organisations to enhance their leadership capabilities and to help business owners develop and grow their businesses. Judith enables individuals, business owners, and organizations to improve their impact and influence. She is also HR Zone's leadership columnist, and her expert opinion has appeared in national, international, and trade press. Welcome back to the Maverick Paradox. This is the podcast for the pathologically curious. So, Kapil, one of the things that I know you were keen to talk about, and I'm keen to talk about too, was the need or the requirement to break the corporate status, the status quo. Tell me more about that. Yeah, um, this is something which has emerged from my own observation of my own life, observation of a lot of my colleagues, my peer groups, um, but more importantly, working with people across so many countries and across various ages. And what I've seen is that everybody has the same plan. Every single person has the same plan and their own plan they think is very, very unique. And the plan is goes something like this, that I'm going to work for, a, I'm going to start working for a good company. Then I'm just going to get promoted. Then I'm just going to find a good place to work at, maybe overseas, maybe in my own country, wherever. And then I'll make a bit, bit, bit more money. Then I will get married, I'll have kids, or I'll buy a car or I'll buy a house. And then I'm going to buy another investment property, then buy another house. And then I'll keep paying the the bills. And then one fine day, I'll have my life sorted out. And when I look at this, when I look at people, if people define their level of happiness and joy and connection, generally speaking, not it's obviously not applicable to everybody. I mean, a lot of people are very happy with their careers and they should stay what they, they should do what they do. But a really very high majority of people have this similar plan. And... Uh, this whole plan goes like, like what I what I described, and it's pretty much. I've seen that people end up following other people's meaning of success. They don't follow their own. They don't define their own meaning of success. They follow other people's meaning of success. They follow other people's way of being, and following the same. And that's what is called rat race. Rat race is not about corporate life. Corporate life life is great life if you love it. Absolutely fantastic life if you love it. And that's what I want to break. That's what. I'm on a mission to break. People, like, you know, we have all heard the the very old cliche thing that the relationship ball and health ball, if you drop, then it's it's just going to be a problem. You can drop the achievement ball, then it's still okay. This whole premises assumes that you can, you have to drop any ball. Like, I really believe in this entire philosophy of playing it full. I believe in this entire philosophy that instead of chasing balance, chase harmony, chase your own meaning, do not stay in this balance zone because if you're on a seesaw, the balance is boring. Let the disturbance, let the disturb, not dis- disturbance, disruption come into one area of your life and just tap into it, play it full, bring other, other areas of your life 
believe in this principle of having it all and actually break the status quo. And that's when you start building careers which are aligned with who you are and what you want to do. Um, that's what I'm very, very passionate about. That's what I'm dedicated in my life to, primarily because I didn't do that. Ho hope it makes sense. Yeah. Thank you for that. I certainly think that that has been the idea for for decades do you really do you think it's still the case when there are so many people now talking about doing their own side business that there seems to be a lot more people who take it as read that whilst they may be working in a corporate organization or a charity or, or some, such like they will still be having um, their own business I mean I, I was an award ceremony uh, last year for example and I sat next to um, who other people who'd also won awards and they were doctors and they had set up their own business. So they were medical students who also had a commercial business and it was for that that they had a won a, an award for. So if you've got doctors who are doing things outside of doctors, doctoring, is maybe maybe people are breaking that kind of corporate thing. What do you think? Uh, yeah, look up. People are doing it and I've got a um, few ideas about it that so one is that breaking the status quo does not mean that leave the corporate job and do something else. I believe people uh, people need to find fall in love with what they do in their work and they should do it very, very well and play it full across all aspects of life. That's one. So it's not that you do something else with your life. Why are you in this corporate life? I think a lot of people love corporate jobs and I love I love seeing them and I see them and they are really successful. So that's one part. Second thing, which is um, I've seen, is that a lot of people who are doing this side hustle and side business and all of it, they're doing it because there is this movement around if you're not doing a side hustle, you're wasting your life. Everybody should become an entrepreneur. Um, you know, and they're doing it for this elusive financial freedom concept, which is often, I, I think, comes from comes from the typical MLM scenario where 2% people become successful and all that stuff. So it's not, if it is coming from the place of, hey, I love that stuff and I want to do it because it's my expression. Uh, you know, that's where I, I love it. And right now I'm doing the incorporate thing is a way to create a runway towards it. I'm, I'm all good for it. But I'm, I'm saying having two different passions to follow and try to make money in both those presses is all about money. Make money. Like you will always make much more money, disproportionately high amount of money doing something that you love. And honestly, if it is incorporate, it's incorporate. Because it's not about the amount of money you make. It's about how how do you make it? And are you really enjoying the process? Um, side hustle is always good. Good. You know, but if it just remains a side hustle, then they will always be struggling and, and then making the relationship ball or health ball usually drop. So don't do it for the elusive financial freedom. Do it because you love it. And then you will do something about it. That, that's what I feel. Yeah, I, I agree. And I suppose, I suppose, whereas once where people would do a job um, and want to work out the corporate ladder, and then if it wasn't going the way that they were, they wanted it to go, we would then leave and and find another job. I guess there is quite a few that are staying to build a side business that will become the main job yeah and that's absolutely fine that's that's absolutely fine um and you know my only problem with that would be that if people then suddenly say that oh and by the way and i also want to get promoted oh and i also want to there's no also just focus on one thing like i remember i in a in a same um you know one of the coaching group i had i had two people one person was absolutely she knows exactly what she wants she's leveraging the corporate work to actually go towards her own business. And for her, the focus wasn't maximizing the amount of money she's making there. And I was absolutely 100% supportive of that. Do that, sure. Maximize the amount of money you can make. The second person was like somebody who's a co career professional, no side business or anything. She just wants to be a corporate person. And she, want, she needed to maximize the designation and the kind of role that she's playing, mm -hmm. not the money part of it. Money then her, for her becomes a thing. And when these two people got talking, they got into this kind of a little bit of a conflicting ideas and both of them had difficulty in understanding each other's opinion. And, and I kind of 
went in to tell them, hey, this, this is the thing, this is where you're coming from. In both cases, choose one thing and be so, so frigging good in that, that you become exceptional. We cannot be exceptional in two things at a time. Like building a business is a hard thing. I've done it. I failed and I, and I failed and failed. Like 90% of it is frustrating. Things that you do 90% of times won't work. And when somebody says, I'm going to do a side hustle and build a business there and all of it to basically, you know, and, and I'll make, I'll do, make both of them really work. All the very best. It ain't happening. Two focuses are going to fail. You pick one thing, really be amazingly good at that. Uh, you know, Oh, yeah. Or you good at neither. Uh, yeah. Before we uh, end for today, is there anything I should have asked you that I haven't? And if which case, then please tell me what that is and tell me what your response is. Well, I think thank you. This is this is good. This is good uh, for this time duration. I think I would just want to um, add one thing that that um, yeah, for me the biggest thing that I would like people to have a takeaway is that that. For a very long time, we have all, lear all learned that you can't have it all. And, and I think that's something that people need to break completely, that you can definitely eat your cake and have it too. You can have it all. We, we can all have it all. But it's my all, not somebody else's all. It's your all. You got to define it. That's probably the only thing I would just add. That's brilliant. And that's a, a fantastic place to end. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Judith. Um, pleasure to be here. I would love to share a link where people can actually get my audio book. Uh, played, it's called Played Pull. It was written five years back, but it's still very, 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 very relevant. So, yeah. Sure. Uh, what's the link? So, it's playitful.com, which is play, P L A Y, playitful.com slash P I F audiobook. Brilliant. Thank you. And thank you out there for tuning in to the Maverick Paradox podcast. I am Judith Jermaine your host and i hope you've enjoyed listening to today's conversation the maverick paradox magazine the maverick paradox magazine is for the pathologically curious written by a swagger of socialized mavericks who are divergent thinkers the magazine tackles the biggest issues affecting maverick leaders today you might be a business owner or a leader within an organization who wants to have your thinking challenged to be exposed to a diversity of thought or to learn from diverse experts in their fields. If so, the Maverick Paradox magazine is for you. Join the swagger at themaverickparadox.com and engage in the conversation.